And good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, 19th of May, 2023, we're going to continue our journey with upside down flies. It'll be mayflies and caddis. And our weekly tip is going to be waiting options. We'll get, get into that more. Tonight, though, we're going to continue with the information that we introduced last week where we showed you upside down flies, but we needed to allow have materials to make those wings to keep from jamming or, or blocking the hook gap so you could hook fish. Too stiff of materials, you can't hook the fish. We need to have soft materials. And we're going to continue that journey. And we'll finish up with the dry flies tonight. And we'll be going into weighted flies next week. But but for now, we're going to um, let's I guess take a look at uh, the materials. No, we need to take a look at the recipe, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, the recipes are one, two, and three. I've got three flies tonight. We're going to start with a stub tail caddis. And this is a pattern that we originally published in Fly Tire Magazine about eight, 10 years ago uh, as a standard fly. We tie it both ways. I'm tying it tonight because it does a good job of illustrating the point of keeping the hook gap cleared with material from materials so a, the fish can be hooked. We're going to be using a tonight a size 12 gray thread. We'll be using deer hair, a dub body. The rib is optional. And um, well, the wing is deer hair. And we can put rubber legs on or we can leave them off and the head will be a deer hair bubble. Let's take a look at the materials camera. And, uh, you know, I really feel bad about, about the materials because um, I've been on Zoom calls over the last several days and everybody has theirs laid out so nice and mine just looks like a train wreck. But I know what's there, but it, it does look like a train wreck. But anyway, we're going to start today with number one, static guard. I didn't didn't use it this afternoon when preparing, and I was sorry. So it's still dry enough around here that we need we need the static garden. And this stuff right here. Why don't you go to the the vice camera, Gretchen? I'm going to give this another plug too. Kathy Hamilton and Jim Ferguson turned us on to that, and with all the construction work we're doing around here, thread magic is the only reason we can have these presentations. But anyway, back to the materials. Okay, and then open that up and just put it on my fingers a little bit. Have you ever noticed that when you're using a hammer in one hand, the other hand keeps getting in the way? I know it never happens to any of you, but anyhow. Okay, we're going to... Today use... you were using the saw. I hope that... Uh... Uh, the saw, I got was really lucky. The power, That table saw would have caused serious damage. <laughs> yeah. Anyway... I'm going to take this this deer here and pull this over here. Uh, <clears throat> get the thread, set it over at the vise. And we're going to need the dubbing. I'll just pull that down here where it'll be easy to get to. And that's about all we're going to need at this stage of the game. Get over here and get a, get a hook and put it in the vise. But before I do that, let me get my focus camera or focus fly out of the out of here and let's review just a little bit from last week last week we started with a a parachute upside down fly it looks really good but as we learned the stiffer calf wing really blocks the hook eye and uh it's really difficult to catch fish with the hook point the hook point i'm sorry yes Jen Gritz, the hook point and it really is difficult to hook a fish with that. I'll set that down over here. So then we talked about how we could tie a fly that was very similar, but we'd use poly yarn and that collapses really well. In fact, I'll use my <clears throat> scissors and that just collapses really well. Shows good definition, nice bulk, will collapse and allow you to hook the fish. And that's what we're after. And we're gonna continue that journey tonight. But before we do, 
I want to talk to you about something I mentioned last week. We didn't have an example, and Gretchen said, what are you talking about? Well, this is the upside-down parachute. And as you can see, I've got a melted monofilament eye on the bottom of the hook so that hackle won't slip off. And I wrap the parachute hackle on that. And then this is a poly yarn wing, which will collapse very nicely. It's um, It looks really good, but in reality, I just can't get the darn things to set on the water quite right. So... But I wanted you to know what I was what I was talking about last week when I talked about the upside down parachute. And there it is. <clears throat> All right, getting a hook. Now let's go to recipe number one, Gretchen, if you would. There, the stubtail, stubtail caddis. <clears throat> okay, we've got all all the materials there. Deer hair. Dubbing, good deal. All right, back to the vise. And we'll just go ahead and mount the thread right there at the hook eye, which we seldom do it that close to the hook eye, but we are in this case. And I'm just going to wrap to the to the back of the shank and back to my starting point. And one of the, one of the things I like to do when I'm working that close to the hook eye <clears throat> is to place um, a half hitch. And I'll just do the half hitch, slide it into place, and there it is. It keeps that thread from slipping off at the most inopportune time. Now I'm going to move over to the materials. And uh, get out a, a little bundle of this deer hair. And one of the things about tying an upside down fly and the deer hair that we use for the when it can be a little softer than what we normally use for for our wings on like the wolves and the humpies and stuff like that. Now I am going to stop on the way to the vice at the waist bin and get rid of all the trash in the base end of the of the so of how the did you get softer hair? What oh that do? good you know that's that's a very good point Gretchen. Uh what I did is let me, let me get that hair into the hair stacker, and um, I'll go back over there to the materials and show you what I'm talking about. Some of you may not know this, and others know the, know the deal better than I do. Anyway, <clears throat> this is a picture from the internet of a deer hide. The really dense, dark hair along the backbone, down over the shoulder and over the rump, is really good wing and tail material for humpies and wolves. As you move down into the rib area, the hair starts getting lighter, like you'll see here. The, I would say probably 80% of the hair fiber is a pretty light kind of a gray, where if you're getting hair out of the center, of the hide, it's uh, very dark almost all the way down to the base. Are there some deer that have softer hair than others? Oh, I would suspect, but all we ever use is white tail and, and uh, trying to keep, keep track of all the different options. Uh, not something I've been able to do. We just use white tail and select it for what, what we needed, needed to do. Okay, now back at the vise, I've placed my deer hair in the stacker. And now I've stacked it. And I'll just put that back together. And I've got, a, got it all stacked, evened up. And I want to measure the wing so it's about as long as the complete hook. And I'm going to turn my vise. One of the things about tying upside down flies is they are a real pain in the neck. And so I'm going to work kind of on the side of the hook and allow thread torque to help me place my wings on the underside rather than on the top. And you see how that just moves it around the hook? Now 
I want to tilt that so you can see that that's all on the bottom side of the hooks, which, which is going to end up being the top of the hook. All right, I'm going to continue wrapping to the to the back of the shank. And then I'm just going to trim off the excess. You notice I left a stub there. That's why it's called the stub tail. It helps in the flotation of the fly because the original fly, it was tied in a traditional manner, did not have any hackle. And so that stub tail actually helps support the overall fly. Now I'm going to go, go ahead and put some dubbing on this. Get my wax out. <clears throat> and now one of the things about working with an upside down pattern is um, one of the one of the things in putting dubbing and stuff on, you've got the vise right here. And I never realized it until I started doing these upside down flies this afternoon that I should have been doing this because it's sure a lot easier to dub and put wax on your thread by getting the dog on vice jaws or the whole vice mechanism out of your out of your way. Now I'll reach over here to the materials and grab my my soft touch dubbing. And uh, I got some gray, and it doesn't make any difference. We're tying an example of the pattern that you can tie more so than a pattern that you actually have to have the exact everything that we do. And I'm just going to touch dub this so that I get a very sparse application all the way up and down my strand of thread. And when I get through twisting it in place, I, I'll get a nice noodle of thread uh, that's. Um, slender all the way through. I was on with a Zoom call last night with Dutch Bachman, and he was talking about the importance of sparse application of materials. And, um, and the truth of the matter is, that's one of the things that we emphasize in many of our classes, is the importance of sparseness, because most of the insects that we are imitating, not all, but I would say uh, the biggest the biggest percentage of them are uh, a lot more slender than most people do when they're when they are uh, applying materials. I need just a tiny bit more dubbing there, and when I say tiny bit, it's going to be like a five or six fibers. No matter how much of that thread magic you get on there when your hands are really in bad shape it still um, doesn't work now i'm just going to rib forward with the thread right through that um until i get up here to the front where i'm going to make the head now i got a wild hair that doesn't want to get with the program so it's going to go away now i'm going to push down on that hair and push it in and, and, and press it back like that. One of the things about tying upside down flies is it sure is easier after all the years I've done of right side up flies to tie most of what you do upside down or right side up so that you end up with a fly that's upside down. I know that that's just, <laughs> just crazy as heck, that, that thought process, but anyway. Now we've got, now what, what's really cool about this is this softer hair collapses very easily, allowing the fish access to the gap in the point of the hook. But it lands on the water without a hook point pointing through. Now, does this make any difference on probably 90% of the water that Gretchen and I fish? Nope. We don't fish a heck of a lot of spring creeks anymore. It's just, they're far enough away and and uh, traveling to them and getting up and down the banks and all the stuff that we have to do just don't happen hap happen as much. Now we have an option here of what do we want to do? The uh, 
we can pull the wing to the side a little bit so it kind of supports the fly so it'll set on the water or we can put rubber legs on it and i'm going to put rubber legs on and uh in the, this case that it, it's uh just a strand of silicone i've got here pull that back around so that the two are pretty much the same i'll set them in place right there and unlike uh, a lot of our rubber leg flies we don't we're not going to want these to be really huge all they are is they're going to be support to support that um, caddis. Now I'm just going to pull the offside one down, even with the body. Make sure that it's even with the uh, all along the body there, so it provides the stabilization that we want. Okay, and I didn't get that one quite even. There, that's looking pretty good. And we'll do a whip finish to, to finish this guy. <clears throat> now, it's really tough to see these the way they're supposed to be when they're, when you're, when you're trying to hold the darn thing and uh, being upside down like this. So what we're going to do is I'm going to temporarily set this down on the platform here and go over to the to the, the tank, and I'm going to put the fly in the tank. All right, now I'll grab my fly. And we'll see how this guy floats on the water. Looks like he's doing a pretty good job. Let's see if we can zoom in on him just a tiny bit. Flipping around there just a bit so he can be seen a little bit better. The outriggers are doing a good job of keeping it there. Let's see if I can drop him in there and if he'll... Whoops, I missed the tank completely. Oh, well... We'll go back to the materials and we'll we'll, we'll use the tank him? for the next one, huh? Did you lose him? He's cleared down and behind the desk. <laughs> uh, the, the, the guy is just like a lot of caddis, he took off on it on me. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> let's get back to the, the the second fly. I guess we'll just go right into it. Anyway, the recipe for the number two fly is the wonder wing upside down. And I talked to you about that last week because it's not the greatest fly for an upside down fly because the looped wing has a kind of a tendency to get snagged around the hook point. Now, it won't keep you from catching a fish, but it tears the wing up. Well, that's all right. We're going to, uh, we'll talk about that in greater detail because one of the viewers last week actually gave me a solution to that whole problem, which we'll cover even in more detail in the third fly that we're going to tie tonight. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to be using a, a size 12 hook, gray thread. The tail is hackle fibers. The wings will be wonder wings. Uh, the rib is a tying thread. If you want it, it'll be soft touch dubbing. Hackle is, um, it says grizzly, but I think I'm going to use something else because I got something here to get rid of. And um, th uh, thread for the for the head. And let's see, I'll go. And your gray threads right there. Oh, thank you, sweetie. Yeah. I'll try not to mess this one up. <clears throat> okay. Got my gray dubbing here already. I don't need to get more of it. <clears throat> get a hook out. There we go. Get the gray thread out here. And let's see, this is the Wonder Wing. And just like we do on all of our dry flies, upside down or right side up, 
we're going to tie the hackle fiber tail to the bear hook shank. And I'll get over here and grab my uh, materials for the tail. And I think I'll just set that down. That looks like a pretty good batch. I'll just take it over there and use the last of that feather. Looks like that's um, going to work out pretty good. All right. I want that to be just a little bit longer. I like the, my hackle fiber tails to be about as long as the complete hook. Like Dutch pointed out last night in his presentation, the actual tail on mayflies are pretty long. All right, now we're going to make our wings out of the same stuff that we always do, the really webby feathers um, off of a, a, a hen cape. Hey, Al, I've got a, just a quick question from an understanding. Yep. Why did we tie the, the feather directly bare to the hook versus wrapped? Is uh, The reason for that is I, I've, I've done that so many times with everybody. I, I um, just assumed everybody had he heard that explanation before. I'm sorry. Hackle fiber, hackle fibers are dense. Mm -hmm. they, they have very little um, give when you when you tie them tie them to the hook. Unlike like animal hair, which has a lot of uh, flexibility, compression, um, flare, whatever you want to call it. And the extra dimension of a well, fact, let me show you. If you if you if you don't know, there's no reason to try to explain it when I can just show it to you and get another tail. Let's uh, let's go back to the to the vice. Let me uh, get rid of this tail, and we'll talk about that for a minute. <clears throat> all right, throw those away. Let's wrap our thread all the way out to the end of the shank. And then we're going to come back. And yeah, we're, we're going to pretend that we're this is a regular fly. We're going to pretend mm -hmm. that this is a regular fly. And I'm just going to no. put a hackle fiber tail on. And I put it on top of a thread body, which I, I which we don't do. But we are, in this case, for illustration purposes. I'll just tie that on right there. Now, here's what happens in reality. There's dimension of that thread under the tail. It looks really good up to this point. And uh, what will happen is we'll wrap our dubbing covered thread as we're finishing the fly all the way to the end of the, of the thread application that's underneath. That's our body, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we get to put it in our box and get ready to go to the river. And I cannot tell you how many times that I had this happen to me, that something about transportation, whether it's the washboard roads, the bouncing up and down, the, whatever it is, what ends up happening is that last strand of dubbing covered thread slips and you end up with your tails all pointing downhill when you get to your destination. Now, on a standard positioned hook, you really want that tail sticking straight out so you can balance the fly correctly. And, uh, and when it's like that, it's not the way I want it. So I always put the, the uh, tail on um, a bare hook so that there's no dimension for it to slip off of, if you will. Okay, now let me undo all this thread. Maybe I can get lucky and just reuse that tail that I have there. There is one thing different about the hackle fiber tail that that we're going to make right now is that it's going to be on an upside down fly. And that's be, that means that the, the fly is going to be flipped over and we actually want the tail to go down into the bend of the hook like that because the fly is actually going to sit on the water like that.
Okay, now let's get our material out for the Wonder Wing. And notice that I've got two webby N cape feathers placed opposing each other. And I'm going to just stroke the fibers back on those two feathers. And the length of stem that I stroke the fibers back is a length of stem equal to one half the length of the hook shank. And that will give me a looped wing that will um, still be flexible and not twist my leader. And I wanna make sure that they're, they're divided evenly top and bottom. And as you can see, there's more fibers on the bottom that I've got swept back than the top. So I'll use my bodkin to fix that. Now they're evenly divided both top and bottom. <clears throat> now I'm going to tie this to the hook, very short stem fibers and all, and then pull the wing out to the length that I want it to be. But now remember, this is gonna be an upside down fly, so I'm going to tie it on the side of the hook so that my thread torque doesn't have quite as far to, to go to reposition the material. And I'm going to just pull these wings out to the length that I want them to be. And then continue to place them down on the bottom of the hook. That's not quite long enough. There we go. Yep, that'll be just fine. Now I'll trim off the waist and wrap this in place. <clears throat> All right, I'll wrap forward and, and wrap a thread down in front of my wings to make them stand up straight or point down straight until I flip it, flip it back over. Yeah, that's, that's going to be about right. I want you to notice that they're, they're not quite on the very bottom of the hook. And so I grab them with my hand. Now watch my, you can't see my left hand, but I actually twist the vise away from, and what that does is reposition those wings right to the bottom of the hook. And now you can see that they're, they're on the bottom of the shank. They weren't there just a little bit ago. <clears throat> now I'm gonna leave that just like that until I get everything the way I want it get my dubbing on and all, my, all of that stuff. Get a wild fiber in the tail. That's what scissors are for. All right, all the <clears throat> sparse application of dubbing to the thread. Twist the thread in a clockwise direction. And then clockwise is the direction is from, from the position of uh, standing on top of the hook shank looking down. Hell, why do you wrap it clockwise as opposed to counterclockwise? Okay, um, <clears throat> as I'm wrapping this on here, John, the every turn around the hook, if you look if you're standing in front of the hook, looking at it from in front, all my turns are going around the hook clockwise. The dubbing is put on clockwise. And you already know that uh, to get those clockwise spins out of the thread, I have to spin it counterclockwise like I'm doing right there. Oh, okay. And gotcha. What happens, okay, if you're a person that dubs, 
And I've, I've seen this happen all the time. And the reason I'm so good at, at recognizing this, because I did it for 40 years wrong. And if you dub like this, you put your dubbing on the thread. Okay, now you wrap three, two, three, four turns. Up, stop, it's loose. Twist, 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 twist. Wrap, 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 wrap. Twist, 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 twist. If that's what you're doing to dub, there's a very good possibility that whatever direction you're wrapping on the hook, right or left-handed, let's say right-handed, you're going clockwise around the hook, that you're loosening your dubbing with every turn. And so we, uh, if you twist the dubbing uh, clockwise and you wrap clockwise, it keeps the dubbing tight on the thread. If that makes any, it makes any yeah. sense to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to tie on my hackle. And I want you to notice that just like any other fly, I've got a bare piece of stem here, and I want to make sure that I have bare stem poking up above the hook shank so that my first turn of, of hackle doesn't have fibers poking back that it'll actually will, will and they're going to poke back right there so i've i've got a problem i didn't leave enough bare stem let's take a look here oh i didn't strip it i want you to notice i've got it stripped really good on one side not on the other side well i can fix that now when i tie it on the bare stem that i thought i was leaving on both sides now it'll lay in in place perfect once, watch how I start to move that into place. And see that will we'll lay perfectly in there <clears throat> without leaving any wild fibers around. Okay, now it's time to work with my wings for just a minute before I wrap the hackle. All right, I'll trim off the waist. And remember, on Wonder Wings, the waist is not waste. It's future flies. So I'm going to put the future flies into a clip so it's ready for the next fly. I'll set that back over in the materials area. And then I'm going to start to wrap my hackle. Now you see how stripping that out lays all those fibers directly in line instead of It's instead of sticking back, and not that the fish give a darn, but you should be tying flies that look good to you. And of course, if they look good to you, maybe they'll look good to the fish, and maybe they won't. You don't know. But now I'm going to go ahead and finish the fly. Pull everything back and put build a head, thread head. It's also a jam knot. Trim off the waist. And I'll get my whip finish tool. And now we want to flatten our fly on the bottom. In fact, let me show you. What we want to, what we actually want to do is we want to fly that looks like this. You see how the, we've got a, a footprint there in front by pulling the hackle off to the side or up to the side so we don't have it all the way around? Well, that's our goal. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to use a Lou Duncan method tonight. The other night I used, uh, the hair dryer, hair dryer works, works fine, but I'm going to use the Lou Duncan method tonight. I'm going to be adventuresome. I'm going to take a chance because the Lou method can cause, you can have problems with it if you're not careful. And that is, I'm going to heat the, the bodkin with a flame. And if I make it too hot, I won't 
Well, I'll probably end up burning the hackle, and I I don't want to do that. But I just want to have a hot enough needle to lay those out to the side. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I think I need to do just a little bit more. That'll probably be my, be my mistake. And I'll just... Okay, well, let's take this guy out and take a look at him. Well, he looks pretty good. Let's try him on the tank. I'm going to try not to throw this one down behind the desk. Can you go more sideways with that camera rather than so much from the top? Can you go down? But so? down here? Yeah. I'll be going through the plastic, but I probably can. Let's see if you can kind of focus that now. There, now you can really see how he's sitting there. Oh, well, that's looking pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Let's... Uh... Okay, well, we're just going to let him float for a while. Instead of trying to pull him out of there and ended up with him down behind the, <laughs> we're just going to leave that, leave that just like it is. We're going to get to the last fly. And the last fly, well, it's called the K-Dunn. It's never been tied before. It was just a nightmare that I had last night in the middle of the night, and I decided to put it into use today. The K-Dunn, one fly again that's never been tied <laughs> it's inspiration by john Kareff. now john i don't think he's on tonight but anyway let's let's i'll come back to this recipe here in a minute but let's go to something else i get lots of things from email and once in a while from a phone call but mostly from email from people talking about different things and uh, my email, and once in a while, the regular mail, too, I'll open it up, and I'll have a real surprise in there. And from John, I got a real surprise. And his discussion was about last week and having the flies land perfectly on the water. And I was balancing my flies and using the parachute method to get them to the water and the... Uh, stabilizers to keep them even and stable on the water so that they would look like that. Looks good, don't it? Well, John was telling me, and I'm rethinking my whole position now, but John was telling me that he says, I would venture a guess during a hatch, the ones that I've been photographing lately, that there's an awful lot of the flies that end up like that. Wow. Is it laying on its side? Laying on its side. He says they're there. He said, and or that. Upside down. Upside down. In in fact, I'm rethinking my whole thought process of do they even need to land on the water right or not? Does it make any difference? I don't know. I mean, there's there's let's say 40% of the flies end up like this, and the other 60% end up like this. I wonder which ones the fish figure out are crippled. Well, I don't know, but we're going to tie one tonight that can do any darn thing it wants to, and that's why it's going to be called the K Dunn. The K Dunn is going to be on a size 12 hook. We're going to use gray thread, hackle it's fiber kale. K for Kreft. K for Kreft, yeah. Okay. It's too bad that John can't be on tonight, but that's all right. We can use his name in vain then. 
And the wings is going to be CDC, Chickaboo, or any other fiber that you want it to be, as long as it's soft enough to allow it to collapse so the fish has access to the gap and point of the hook. And the rib will be tying thread. That's optional. Gray dubbing. We could use rubber legs if we want. Uh, we're not going to, though. And the head can be dubbing hair or feathers, whatever. Well, that, in other words, it's a pretty open um, idea as to what we're, what we're actually going to do. And we're going to make a fly that's going to look, when we throw it in the tank, it probably isn't going to set up straight. That's okay. Yeah. Let's uh, get over here to the vise <clears throat> and get another hook in there now. I've been kind of looking forward to doing this one. Well, I, another thing I've noticed, I haven't tied upside down flies for a while until we've started this adventure together. Uh, just because I haven't fished a lot of spring creeks much, and most of our most of our fishing, quite frankly, I would say ninety percent of the flies in our personal fly boxes are um, the bubble den that we talked about here a while back. Well, all that is is a compare den with a bubble head. We just think that it gives a better profile to the fly on the water. That that one, and let's see. Here's a here's a here's a a, a caddis with the a, a different one with the with the legs on it. Some have legs, some don't, and that was the stubtail caddis. Those are probably the only caddis and mayflies we have in most of our personal fly boxes. Okay, back to this K done though. Get my scissors. <clears throat> I'll give myself just a little bit of space right there. Again, this is the first time I've ever tied this fly, so I'm just sort of uh, the blind leading the blind right now. And, you know, we have all these wild ideas, and you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning staring at the ceiling and uh, dream up all these ideas, and that's how this one came came into play. Now, whether it's going to actually become a reality, we don't know. I'm kind of hoping that some of you will take the idea and we're going to find out whether those flies do have to be nice and upright or whether flopped on their side to be just fine. And remember, this is going to be an upside down fly, so I'm wrapping down slightly into the hook bend. Hey, Al, my yeah. experience when we have the mayfly hatch in Storm Lake, they're all over the place, some upright, some down. It all depends upon really the water action, at least from you know my recollections. Uh huh. I'm I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you. Never really paid much attention though myself. When you're fishing more broken water, um, if you don't get as much of a chance to study the insects like you do when you're on flat water or spring creek water where there's much slower moving water or lake water, you know. So the guys that are fishing there will will have a chance to see a lot more, though. I have to admit that I saw a heck of a lot more. I, I didn't see a lot of cripples when I was fishing the uh, the spring creeks in the Paradise Valley. Um, just just didn't see it. And, and I, I, By the way, as a side, Fred wanted to know where we get our hooks and what brand are they and do you sell them? They're not on the website. We used to sell them, Fred, um, but we, we kind of quit doing that because there were so many on the market. Uh, yeah, it was, it was tough to compete. We, uh, let's see, Fred, we, our last order of uh, hooks, uh, well, whether you know it or not, no matter what country they say the hook is from, it's manufactured in one of two places, Korea, or China, and the ones that you that are sold as Japanese hooks are manufactured in Korea or China, and then they're shipped to you through Japan. And it's a, they keep them in stock and send them out. Well, anyway, so we we had access to uh, a hook in China or a hook factory in China for a while, and then one in Korea, and we ended up working with the one in Korea more than the one in China. Our last order was a hundred thousand hooks. And 
I'm sorry. I just hundred thousand hooks. So I just had to say it. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah, it's a lot of hooks. But now when we think about it, we have there's uh, let's see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's say there's ten styles of hooks, and then there's um, six different sizes in that. And you don't have to have a lot of thousands to come up with a hundred thousand. You know, when when you start figuring it all out. But anyway, quite frankly, we got tired of counting hooks out. <laughs> so we we would measure them with a gunpowder scale. That still wasn't good enough because I'll guarantee you somebody will really gripe at you a lot if you sell them a hundred hooks for XYZ price and they only get 98. They won't ever gripe if there's 105 in the package. But anyway, I just got tired of counting out hooks and we've got a lot of hooks here. If anybody wants some, we'll work you a deal. So Fred. Appreciate it. I'll get yeah. back to you. Okay, for sure, for sure. Anyway, back to what we were doing. And that is, it's what I want to do for the wing. I am going to use my favorite, my favorite yeah. material, Chickaboo, that's been treated with, with a water guard. In fact, in this case, it's Kiwi Camp Dry. But I'm going to use Chickaboo. So I'll just set that down for right now. <clears throat> and yeah. yeah. You know, when you were, I was, trying to find the book and I can't find it, but there's a book that's on caddis patterns and it's by one of the more famous, two of the more famous authors. And they talk just about what you were saying that when they tie one of the flies, when they trim the hackle purposely so that the fly will lay over oh. on its side. I'll have to find that book and, uh, <clears throat> send you that reference because they well, talk I, uh, about the cripples i haven't purposely had them uh do that before and and john craft has got me rethinking that that process i mean quite yeah. frankly the bulk of our tying has been for customers with whose expectation is a and then you pick the name Royal Wolf, <laughs> don't care caddis, whatever the heck, you know, and that's what they're expecting to receive. And um, was it wasn't didn't we tie a drunken sailor? Was it that was the one we we did that with La Fontaine? We uh, did it on video for on it's a, it's on one of our videos with him. I think it was about video number four or five. But uh, but it was weighted so that it yeah it's going over. It's going to be coming up in future issues of. The presentations that we're doing right now because next week we're going into um weighted flies and um there's a lot you can do with uh waiting on flies who would the hook point and riding riding up la fontaine did a whole lot of stuff though where he would weight one side of the hook so that when you pull on the leader the 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 hook would right itself and when you paused it would flip over on its side you know it was just kind of a weird action and it would often cause fish to strike just because I don't know they probably were curious as to what is this what was this crazy scud doing flipping over I I don't know you know but it's uh, something like that anyway we're back to tying um, tying this guy and I, I got to think for a minute what was I going to do oh dubbing next that's what I'm going to do okay <clears throat> right. We'll get that right there. Now I got a question. How much dubbing wax do you put on? I mean, just from a visual perspective. Enough, okay. I mean, the dubbing wax, excuse me. Yeah. First, I want you to notice the dubbing wax barely peaks up above the edge of the tube. Okay. If it's cranked way up, uh, it's going to have grooves a lot worse than you see on that right there and what ends up happening is it comes off in clumps on the on the thread and you can see just about how much i got on there there's not much there and it's uh, fairly magnified it, it's just sticky enough to grab the dubbing but what you do not want is well let's see right here i can cause it to what you don't want is that okay and that's now i gotta get rid of it <laughs> well, I'm not making a mess. Sorry. 
Uh, that's all right. I mean, I know you guys are just trying to screw me up, but I know what's going on here. That is want, my nemesis. You just want to see the old guy stumble down the road. I know. Okay, here we're going to have to work at it. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks a lot, Gretchy. Okay, twisting in a clockwise direction. And John Wright already knows why we're why we do that. <clears throat> All right, now we want to put on a wing, and I'm using treated, treated um, chickaboo. I could be using everybody else's favorite CDC. It's not my favorite. Of all the feathers to, that I've had, I've ever tied with in my life, I like tying with CDC least of all. Don't ask me why. I just don't like it. Okay, now I'm going to tie this on the side of the hook and use thread torque to position it on the bottom. Just like that. Okay, good. Yep. We don't want it. Okay, we're going to have to wrap some dubbing in front of that to kind of push that wing back just a little bit. <clears throat> At least nobody has distracted me enough tonight for me to forget to put my lid back on my wax and then knock it down into the trash bin. I haven't done that for a couple of weeks now, so it's that's good. Okay, let's get our half-inch tool. And another half-hitch and a double. Now, no stabilizers. That's just... Um, a done right there. No stabilizers. I'll guarantee you when we put it in the water, it's going to fall on its side. So let's give it a try. Let's see here. That damn thing didn't fall on its side. <laughs> it is leaning. <laughs> it's 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 leaning, yes, it's leaning, and uh, it'll it, probably end up there after it gets beat around a little bit. But it it's with the hook down. And it's even it's right up. side up. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it, hey, it's upside down. That's right. <laughs> no, it it's, it is on its side. It's still upside the wrong side up. No, actually, Jim. No, it's not. <laughs> I'll bet when the head gets pulled, it's going to twist it a little bit to push it down under. What do you think? Slap <laughs> it no, in the, the water. <laughs> the tail's right down here. Well. Throw it into the water. <laughs> do, what, do, what, do what to it? Throw it into the water. <laughs> Like if you're pretty disappointing, your Al, that you can't tie a lousy, lousy fly. There you go. <laughs> that was it's, good. It's, it's landed flat on its side now. That's what we wanted was it for it to land on its side. Now whether that's going to convince the fish that it's bad or or not, I have no idea. Rick says the book baby hatches by 
Klaus Kochi and Nastasi. Hatches, okay. Yeah, they did. In fact, if I remember right, too, they were the fellows that came up with the the no hackle, which eventually became the Comparadon and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> well, is it time to see Evelyn's flies? Yes, it's time to see <laughs> Evelyn's flies. Uh, but we usually go to Sherry after oh. we've done the tip. Oh, that's right. We're so leaving that's... Evelyn after we go to Evelyn after go, we've done yeah. the tip. Go to the go to the sharing, which is sharing. Oh, sharing! I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I yeah. thought you said we'll, sherry. We'll get into so it. <laughs> but, but first, let's get to the let's get to the tip. Okay. And um, let's see how I'm going to set this up. Okay, next week we're going to be talking about waiting hooks in three possibilities. And. Uh, our goal, remember, is to have a hook that will travel through the water column with the hook point up. And uh, unlike a lot of our dry flies that we've been talking about, Gretchen and I fish very few dry flies with a hook point up. But I'll tell you what, probably half of the streamers and stuff that we have in our boxes are one version or another of a weighted upside down type of a fly. Well, for one thing, it just kind of crawls across the bottom and the rocks and stuff, and it hangs up less. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about, though, on this is right here. We're going to talk about the simple tools. And in fact, if I remember, this was something we learned in school and probably the physics class. You had the lever, the wheel, the pulley, the plane, the wedge, and the screw. We're going to be talking about the lever and its relation to hook points traveling up or down. Now, let me go back to the, to the vice camera. And I'm going to ask you a question. Now, right here, I have a hook and a three-inch section of lead wire. They're not, a, they're not attached to each other, other than in this hackle pliers, for me to show you that I have two pieces of equipment, a hook and lead wire, but they're not attached to each other. Okay, set that aside. Remember that, the bear hook. Now, the next thing is that same style of hook, the same three inches of lead wire, but it's wrapped around the hook and we kind of crisscross over it with some, with some um, thread. And... Uh, that's a slightly weighted hook shank. Or here's a hook shank weighted differently. As you can see, I've got three inches of wire tied to the shank. But which one of those three hooks do you think has the best chance of traveling in the water column the other way with the hook point up? This one, or that one, and I'm not even going to pick up the bare hook because we know that it's going to travel in the water column, hook point down until we do something to cause it to flip over. I wonder which one of those will flip over the quickest and the best. Well, I'll tell you right up front, the one that will flip over the best is the one that has weight and leverage on that weight. Yep. On the back side. And that one will, will flip over in a heartbeat because of the way the weight is positioned. This one will struggle some with its weighting. It's going to take a little bit more weight if it's directly on the hook shank for it to counteract against the weight of the round of the bend and the hook point because that's also weight with leverage if you look at it. So anyway, those are questions, answers coming next week. Sharing on BTs. And we want to see what Evelyn has for us tonight. Okay, okay there we go. All right. There is the stubtail canvas. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Okay. <clears throat> then here's the, oh, the Wonder Wing's not really very good. 
That's all because right. I'm missing the the um the wing. <laughs> <laughs> Because it didn't, it didn't show is, up. Is, is it harder to draw them upside down than it is right side up? Or does it make any difference? No, it doesn't matter. Oh. Okay, and here's the uh, K done. Whoops, there it is. That looks pretty darn good to me. Thanks. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, good Evelyn. To, good to be back. <laughs> hey, good, good to have you back. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to share? I believe uh, two days ago, uh, if you're an FFI member, you received an invitation to our first annual uh, fly tying group, Branson Rendezvous in Branson, Missouri on September 14th, 15th and 16th. Uh, uh, it'll be a great time. And uh, we've got two days of nonstop fly tying. We have about a hundred tires. We have a, a banquet. We have a fly tires dinner and several other activities, a lot of auctions, et cetera. So it's, it's now time to see each other in person. So uh, um, hope you sign up. And if you have any questions, uh, get in touch with me at flytyerfred at gmail.com. We'll do it, Fred. We're looking forward to it. We've uh, we've kind of changed our travel plans in relation to the in, in, in relation to the rendezvous, and we were going to make a long trip down through Texas and other places. And now we've got some other things come up, and we're going to end up flying to Branson and flying into Springfield and driving to Branson from there, and and going that route. But we're still looking forward to seeing everybody again. It's been a long dry spell that we haven't seen our friends except through Zoom. And in fact, some of the friends, we have never seen them anywhere in mud soon. So anyway, Fred, thank you so much. That's it for tonight, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, that's a wrap. <laughs>